Great. Well, others, I know I'll be joining as we go forward, but I'd like to just start really quick by um, calling out your name for my participant list. If you can just say what league you are um, a member of, so we all kind of get to know each other a little bit, that'd be great. And I'll start with our co-presenter today, Carol Stoddart. Hi, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm with the St. Paul League. Excellent. And Ann Seymour. Edwin. I'm just this <laughs> I love your <laughs> ring, though. <laughs> a good environmentalist has a bird chirping for her. <laughs> Red wing, if you didn't hear me over yes. the phone. <laughs> Thanks, Ann. Uh, Ann Wildenborg. Red wing. Red wing, yay. And Lynn Lewis. Dakota County. Great. Phyllis. Uh, St. Peter area. That's right. Rob Schumer. Uh, Dakota County. Great. Barb Barani. Oh, we missed you. Roseville You're area. Roseville area. Great. Adi Valdal. I am in Rochester. Rochester. Great. Jean Rainbow. Golden Valley. Golden Valley. All right, Kathleen Doran Norton. Northfield Cannon Falls. And Sherry Hood. Roseville area. Great. I think that's everybody. We might have a few other people joining, but we will get started. So um, I am going to share my screen and get our slides going here. All right, so thank you all very much for being a part of our presentation today. Some of you are a member of the Climate Change Task Force, so some of this will be a reminder for you or an update or you'll know what we're talking about, but that's also great to have folks who might add that nuance into our conversation today. So. Um, our first August Academy has been this week and we've had just really great participation and a um, lot of interest from people, which has been wonderful. So we really wanna have more regular training programs and networking opportunities for league leaders and to help orient people to their roles and basically how to use LWVUS and LWVMN resources successfully. That's a big piece of it. Um, so if you guys are already doing things in your local leagues, we're not trying to supersede or supplant those good efforts. We just want to make sure that our um, resources help complement what you're doing. Um, and of course, encouraging more regular networking among league, lead, league leaders and getting your feedback as well on things as we go forward. So we're going to uh, kind of talk about five quick things here today. Um, one is a little bit about our positions on our natural on natural resources, because everything when we're acting as part of league comes from our positions, which have been studied and voted on by consensus or brought to consensus, although we do vote on our positions. Um, also, so climate change itself has really uh, become an important priority uh, with racial justice and democracy. I would say those three pieces both intersect. We all know that these intersect. And I think that's another real exciting piece about where we're at is that um, we're all seeing and being able to program to and educate others about the intersection between climate change, democracy, and as well as racial justice. And then we'll talk a little bit about, I wanna talk a little bit about our, um, our inner league organization, our partnership with Minnesota Environmental Partnership, and then our climate change task force and the, uh, the majority of the time, actually I'll run through these things fairly quickly, but we'll be spent, Carol Stoddart's gonna review a primary area of advocacy for us, which is the climate change report card. And more or less, what can we as local leagues actually do? Um, there are many things we can do, and we really want to help you um, be successful at your local league. So I'm thrilled that Carol has been able to accept leadership and, and help us drive this forward. Um, so first of all, I want to take a minute to really look at um, our position. So we often are 
asking ourselves, gosh, can we act on this? Can we act on that? And, um, and really, uh, this is sort of our little mini Bible uh, of what we believe in, what we care about based on what has been studied. And it's very interesting when you look at natural resources, it's a big chunk. I mean, it's, it's seven pages worth, but there's a lot there. There's a lot that has happened, a lot we can act on. And it's important to, I think, to really look through this. I'm going to kind of scroll through. I'm sorry, it's kind of hard for the eyes here, but... Um, but if you go to the section, which we'll get to, <clears throat> now some of these, of course, intersect when I, when I think about things like um, citizen rights. We, of course, have a lot of things going on with regards to free speech and uh, protesting and things like that, which are really present right now in the climate change movement. Um, all right, but our natural resources um, have there's a lot in here to promote an environment beneficial to life through the pr protection and wise management of natural resources in the public interest. And so it would be really good to take a minute to for you guys um, to go to our website and uh, peruse our, nat our, our positions. And like I said, when, when there's a US position, that means it is a state position. So anything that's US is a position of our leagues. But if you want something specific to state government or to um, local government, then we add our own positions. And we haven't had um, a lot of those, but for example, you'll see here under air quality, um, the US has a position, but M MN added a position at one point to support measures to reduce air pollution from vehicular and stationary sources, including development of more energy efficient transportation systems. So we do have even more powerful statements um, related to land use planning, uh, preservation of resources that Minnesota ourselves have also studied and tied in. So as folks are great to remind us um, in the climate change task force, we, hate, we have a lot of good systems to act on here. It's interesting in the Great Lakes and when we talk about um, the Great Lakes, there's no specific position for US, but look at the Minnesota. We have a, a very big um, participation on our um, a position on our Great Lakes system um, because obviously we're part of that. So. So this is a great tool um, for you to have to be able to get familiar. Here's the climate change position. If you'll notice, and this is really the kind of the cornerstone of our conversation, this US position is 2019. That's how new this position is uh, for National uh, League. But that while we don't have any additional position at this point, we certainly um, would abide by, follow, and can use the US position as we promote our own advocacy. Um, I do want to show you really quickly. Um, <clears throat> where you can find on our website, um, the League of Women Voters of Minnesota website, where we stand. This is where we have it right here, our positions. So it's right at the top where we stand, our positions, our program for action. Um, and the impact on issues is really also a great document to look at the progress made over time on issues as part of the League. So good stuff there. Um, and then, as I said, the U.S. Um, position on climate change is new, but they immediately did develop a toolkit for climate action. And so there is a lot here, a lot of information, I mean, uh, you know, a lot to um, digest, which was part of um, our hope with the climate change, uh, climate change task force, too, is we want to be able to act on and be active participants um, using this toolkit and being able to uh, use the, the resources available to us from LWBUS in our own work. A lot of times it feels like people tar start from scratch, but that's what we wanna remind folks. We have a lot of resources already here. And that was a big piece of what the climate change task force themselves said as we were forming. You know, it's not like we need new resources. We have to learn how to best integrate and act on the resources that we already have available to us. So 
Um, I actually am going to talk just briefly about the Minnesota Environmental Partnership, seeing it's linked here, and then we'll go to UM. Are, are. But actually, our um, connection with climate change and environmental protection overall has been longstanding through our relationship with the Minnesota Environmental Partnership. Um, we uh, every year vote on a set of partners for whom we uh, support based on our issues. And Minnesota Environmental Partnership is probably the organization we have the strongest partnership with in that we um, tell them that if there are letters coming out, uh, advocacy letters that are on their letterhead, we have sort of an automatic sign us on because we believe in their process and in their positions and as being a fellow 501c3 <coughs> organization. So what's great about also about them is when you, um, if you have a chance to, um, to look at their site, which I would really, support is look at all the organizations that are involved in their partnership and it is sort of daunting right all the groups that are working um it is a hopeful thing right that there's a lot of groups looking at um at climate change and uh we're one of them so that's exciting um <coughs> also i wanted to point out um <coughs> if I have their legislative summary here. They have a really great legislative summary, um, but I wanted to show you um, kind of their tagline here, um, legislative outcomes against their priorities, building forward at the scale and timeline our communities need, climate change, racial justice, economic recovery. So again, you're seeing how everyone is really starting to see that intersection between our democracy, racial justice and climate change, which while sometimes it feels like there's not a lot of hope, <laughs> there are um, there are some things to be hopeful of as some of these new awarenesses come to pass. And actually the, the outcomes, there, there were some good things happening. So you'll wanna take a minute and look at that as well. So that kind of brings us to our league organization as a whole then. We are part of what is called an interleague organization. There are, um, this is where we participate with sister leagues around key issues. There's a variety of ILOs all over the um, country, but this is one that is specifically among regions that, um, that depend on and, and are part of the Mississippi River region. And so we have individual organizations um, that participate, our member leagues that participate. Um, and then there's lots of different ways people can get, get on board uh, participating in the work that they are doing. Minimally just um, even, you know, they have a lot of sign on letters, a lot of action, a lot of things happening, but you'll see uh, Gwen right here, their website, and you can sign up for their monthly newsletter. Um, Gretchen Sable, who is of uh, ABC, is one of, I think, is Gretchen the president right now or head of communications, I forget, but, um, but Gretchen is, um, really doing a lot of good work in this area. And if you wanna get more involved and connected to what they're doing, we really encourage that. I forgot to also say with regards to our Minnesota Environmental Partnership, I'm also really grateful to Kathleen Doran Norton, who's on this, uh, our Zoom today, who is our lead. So we have a lead from the league that sits on MEP, again, helping to really bring those relationships solid into life. So that brings us to the climate change task force. Anybody can be a task force member. Um, and we have new people joining all the time, which is very exciting. So um, this is our current list of people who have officially said, put me on the email list. And we're officially getting too big. And now we'll, uh, which is, I mean, not too big, really big enough that we will start to, um, use our database as a way of communicating with everybody and sending out power mails. Um, but um, I want to show you on our website, we have a whole web page. Again, under what we do, you will see a climate change task force. And this is where it is. So we have a whole web page now kind of dedicated to our group. We did a charter, kind of what are we about? Um, how we are, what the roles and responsibilities are, some of the assumptions we have, again, that we 
are um, talking about those assumptions that, um, for example, we're going to use the toolkit, we're going to be part of these other organizations. I think one of the things that one of the conversations we've had and that's ongoing and still always dynamic is the second assumption where we want to maximize the strength that league can bring to the table and not become a simple rubber stamp for any specific program issue. When possible, we would take leadership on environmental issues that also intersect with good government issues such as transparency. So while we participate as an ally, largely we are an ally with organizations on uh, different environmental issues. Um, but we, you know, I think we're all, we're looking and part of the goal of this group at the task force is to look at where will we have leadership? Um, this issue around transparency and governmental regulations and regulatory capture, these have been big things where we feel like we could increase our advocacy um, in the years to come. Another assumption is league volunteer leadership is needed to move this forward. Um, you know, we're a small staff of three full-time people. And so we are always looking for and utilizing the wonderful um, volunteerism of our league members. That's kind of our capacity. How fast can we go? How much can we do? Depends on our ability to pull our team together. So um, I wanted to also point out that um, about lobbying generally, and, and that's just a reminder that we um, as a state league can, we, or as a local leagues, people can certainly advocate um, on local issues uh, within their local communities without any input or guidance from the state. Um, as a state, we can then take input, you know, take advocacy leadership forward without input from the federal government. But then when it comes to federal government, we need to participate in, we need to be in touch with our LWVUS um, counterparts, largely just to coordinate. It's not a control feature as much as being successful in our advocacy coordination. And sometimes that's hard because they're, you know, in the world of our environmental issues, we have a lot of, um, you know, we do have a lot of, you know, is the Boundary Waters is essentially a federal land, you know, what, what, what's federal, what's state, what's local, sometimes those literal boundaries, literal and metaphorically get, are hard to determine, um, but we work together to, to do that for sure. So um, task force members can submit information to and to go into our all member news that goes out to our members. So we're trying to better educate our membership as a whole on issues of climate change and submissions can be sent to me by 12 noon, the Friday before the second Monday. And this was a big thing that we talked about in our first few meetings. To create additional resources, the task force will try to elevate the work of other environmental and climate change partner organizations versus trying to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's a really good thing. And toward that end, um, we have also listed our members, most of our initial founding members here. And part of this was too to get little bios on members because I think it's just really impressive when you look at um, our league women <laughs> and men and the great things they're doing and the background and interests they have. And we wanna continue to tell and promote that story. Um, but if you look at, again, where we're trying to go here, which is to really elevate other organizations, we've been putting links to other organizations that um, our members are a part of that we want people to know about. We're happy to add organizations here that are 501c3 organizations working toward the same end. We also try to put up information about um, upcoming events and programs that people can participate in. So we're really trying to kind of grow our website and have a place where people who are interested in climate change can learn and hopefully jump in and take action. So, um, but the one of the big actions that we wanted to talk about today, uh, first of all, before we get into the climate report card, are there any questions about anything so far? Um, I can't see you all really well when I'm screen sharing. So just jump in or if someone has a question. 
Okay, so we'll we'll come back to you all later. So um, oh, let me go back to my report card. So now I'm going to ask Carol Stoddart to kind of walk us through um, this really cool advocacy tool and also talk about why we joined on and what and how it can be used at the local level. Carol. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be part of the Climate Change Task Force. Um, I'm kind of going to describe myself, and I think that what I'm about to say is going to apply to everybody on this Zoom call. For, you know, for years and years, I have been sure that, that we are experiencing climate change. I don't think that's a doubt in anybody's mind. And after the last couple summers, um, it is clear to me, and I bet it's clear to everybody on this call, that we are in a crisis position. So what's left there is the thought of what to do. That's what I've been struggling with. I retired three years ago. I've really wanted to be doing something and not known what to do. And then voila, the League of Women Voters started the Climate Action Task Force. So I joined it. And then I had this wonderful opportunity to be our liaison, liaison with the Climate Action Report Card. And actually, Michelle, could you scroll down to the, um, the why this, the climate? Right there, okay, the why. There we go. So this is really thought very clearly thought out as to why the um, league became involved. Um, I'm not going to actually read it because you can read it, but I just wanted you to know that it was a very carefully thought out process on the part of the league before we got involved. So this is a coalition of several different organizations that are involved with climate and environment. You know, we're part of it, the uh, Minnesota Environmental Partners, the Sierra Club, Take Action, um, uh, clean water, take action, clean water, um, you know, the list goes on and on. And the thought was that our governor ran saying that he was going to do a lot of things to help um, to prevent climate change. And he, and, and therefore many of these organizations endorsed him. <laughs> he has not done that. And he has actually gotten to the point where he's not really particularly interested in meeting with these organizations anymore. So they all thought, okay, now we really got to communicate clearly with the governor while he's in midterm, while there's still action for him, there's still time for him to start living up to his promises. And what better way for a governor who used to be a school teacher himself than to give him a report card. So um, they have carefully put together this climate action report card. It's got nine different areas on which he's being graded. And the beauty, of, and it's all based on science. It's not just pulling grades out of the air. It is very carefully researched. And the absolute beauty of this report card is that depending on how interested you are, you can push through and get more information. So let's look at where he's got a B, push utilities to clean electricity. So if you click on that, there's a little bit more of a statement about um, what he supports, what he's doing, and how this is important. Now, if you want even more information, you click on the detail, and you've got charts showing about what the emission standards are, what the governor has done, and solid statements on what the governor could do and how this is benefiting, would benefit Minnesotans. So it gives us all of this information that we can use. Let's look at the clean car um, one, Michelle. Mm -hmm. So here's where he's gotten a C. Now I find when I talk about this, this um, report card to my friends are all saying, but Carol, he really went to bat on electric vehicles. And he did, there, there's no denying that, but let's look at the details. 
So if we go into the details, so it says that he is diverting precious resources to out of date and polluting fuels like ethanol. If we go to the details, click on that. Oh dear, have I frozen? Are you all still there? <laughs> I'm here. Are you hearing me? Yep, yeah, sorry. I even have my Ethernet connection, but my internet was unstable for a minute. Sorry about that. So I missed that whole thing. But anyway, I'm here okay. now. <laughs> so, so here we are with his grade C on electric vehicles. So when we scroll down, we can, we can learn more about what it is that he has done and then what it is that he still should be doing. So this is a wonderful tool for us to really have solid information about what the governor is doing. There is a um, website dedicated to this report card so if you just um, Google climate action report card, you will, there we go, waltzclimatereportcard.org. .org, yeah. And you'll find this wonderful site with all of this different information that um, describes it. So this was released right around Earth Day. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives us an opportunity. It gives us something really tangible to shape our work as chapters around having an impact on climate change. Oh, and these are some of the organizations that are involved. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very impressive. Oh, and I wanted to mention, this was very touching to me because two of the organizations reached out to me to tell me how much it meant to them that the League of Women Voters is involved in this coalition. We really have a lot of substance in the community. We really have respect. So to have our name on this really means a lot to the other coalition members. To have an actual participant on the coalition really meant a lot. So now can we look at the screen about what you can do? Yes. OK. So I see this as two parts. The first one is this gives us an opportunity to educate our local chapters about climate change. And part two is we can actually take action. So the education, actually the postcard itself is a great educational tool for us. So it's not only about educating Governor Waltz on what we're thinking about his performance. It is about educating us as the public on what is being done and what needs to be done. So that's one part of education. The second part of education is that there is a webinar put together by the members of this coalition. Um, it was recorded, I have watched it, and it is very informational. It gave me all kinds of more educational thought tools that I could use in my own conversations with people about climate. So th those are the two parts of the education. And then the part that I've been starving for is take action. What can we do? So there is a postcard and I believe you got a, an example yep. of the postcard. Okay, there we are. There's a climate action postcard. It was produced by this coalition of people um, and I have been given the PDF to this so that each league chapter can actually put its name out and send this postcard out to its members to let them know about this whole project and what they can do to be a part of this project. And I just want to throw in a little story about the fun of being part of this coalition. So I was by far the oldest person on this coalition. <laughs> I would be on these Zoom meetings where I would be, oh, 40 years older, 30 years older than they were. It was great fun to do that. But when we came to putting together the report, I was the one who was correcting their um, grammar. <laughs> 
that's great. They, and they were very accepting of that. They were they were grateful <laughs> to have their grammar corrected. Yeah. But anyway, so that's one thing that you can do. It's like the tool is already there. All you need to do is print it and send it out. Um, another thing is to write op eds for your local newspapers. And um, I have spoken with Sarah Wolf at the um, Minnesota Environmental Partners. And she is quite confident that we could wrestle up some volunteers who could put together outlines or a template for an, for an op-ed if your league is feeling that it could use a little help in being effective with that. So we're not just tossing you out there and saying, write an op-ed. You can request a meeting as a group. So your chapter can re request a meeting to talk with the governor about his plans to work for climate change. And I wanna make the point here that just because you ask for a meeting with the government, governor does not necessarily mean that you will get one. But uh, um, the big point here is that if he starts hearing from enough of us around the state, he's really gonna get the message that we are paying attention and that we cared, cared greatly. And then the final idea is to actually develop, have, have your chapter develop its own climate change report card for um, work that's being done on the local level, which I think is a great idea. And again, Sarah Wolf at the Minnesota Environmental Partnership um, encouraged me with this idea saying, you know, I bet we can find information, we can find other organizations that are doing work in the areas that you would be want to be reporting on. So um, there is my name and my email address. Please email me if you want to start working on this project and I will make sure that you have the whole, all of the tools that you need and we can work together on making this happen. You know, I'm just, I'm heartened by how many of you there are, how many different chapters there are represented on this Zoom call we could start really having an impact on what is happening in this state. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. And um, so I wanted now to take a time to take some time to answer questions that you might have, and also to hear from any of you about what you are doing in your own local leagues around climate change, if anything. Um, we actually did this last evening around our um, uh, we were talking about DEI and what people have done since the murder of George Floyd. And I was just overwhelmed by how much local leagues have already started the process and are, you know, when you add up uh, small actions, they really look, you can see the power of, of the league and everyone taking some action in their local communities. So does anybody have a question or want to share uh, something going on in their local area? Um, you can either officially raise your hand or I can see you. We're small enough either way and I can call on you. I know there's a lot going on out there and it's exciting to see um, as we go forward some of the innovation that people have through their partnerships and any questions? Ooh, we lost Sherry, we'll pull her back in here. Uh, yeah, Anne. Well, I, I am with Citizens Climate Lobby as well as League. I'm from mm. Red Wing. And um, we are doing an initiative right now. We're trying to get people to call their house to actually call, or we actually have a link you can use your phone or your computer. Um, we want us to go to the house and um, because it, they're, start, they're going through the process of deciding what action they'll take on climate change. Um, and now until, well, for the next three weeks, it's a real promotion time. It's an opportunity to put a price on carbon. And that's what we're just asking for what, when they do this reconciliation um, uh, process, that they will actually put a price on carbon as one of the issues in there. Um, there's a link you can go to and it is cclusa.org backslash house. 
So, Anne, do you know how to put that into the chat? Could you put that into the chat? I first? Yes, yeah. I mean, you can add the HTTP in front of it, but you don't have to. So I will do that. And then, and they just so you know, at the end, um, they'll, they automatically, they do not sign people up to join CCL, but you have the option to do that. So just so you know, you're not signing up to be in that organization, but CCL is trying to keep track of how many are supporting and so they keep like we had 611 people in Minnesota send this in and that was when we were asking to send to talk to their senate to send this to the senate but putting a price on carbon is not in that reconciliation bill yet um, mm -hmm. they say that probably in mid September that's that's where they're think where they think they think they'll be doing this um, reconciliation process it's just kind of a plan anyway. So thank you for listening. And I will put that in a link. Yeah. And Anne, if you, yeah, if you put that there and send that to me, I can, we can add that onto our webpage too and put thank it in you. our next. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Basically, uh, Rob? Yep. I wanted to ask uh, Carol uh, what the, Governor's uh, report card, how does that not violate the nonpartisan uh, positions of the league? Um, so if you have a report card on the governor, do you have a report card on, on every legislature, legislator so that we well, know where they stand? Uh, otherwise, it seems like that kind of information could be used in a partisan way, uh, certainly to attack the governor. Uh, I can take that one on, Carol, if you want. Why don't you do that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, two things. This is a really great question that I want to address. First of all, um, as we really have two seasons for our election, elected officials, when they're candidates and when they are not candidates, right? So the governor is the governor doing his job. Um, if the governor um, was a candidate and running for office after he's filed for office or anyone's filed for office after the office filing date, we would not have signed on to the climate change report card because we are more careful during the candidate phase, right, to not support candidates um, or parties. But we do always um, advocate with legislators on their positions and as governor, not as a DFL or a Republican governor, as governor, um, it's very appropriate for us to say, and, and re, you know, these are the issues that you talked about. These are the where you're at with the issues. Um, that is our job, right, as advocates to hold our government officials accountable. What we liked about this piece was that it's not a shame and blame piece either. We're not to say, oh, bad you. <laughs> it's saying, hey, there's a lot out here. You're doing great on these things. I think you should be looking at these things. And so um, it really is that accountability factor um, where it's appropriate to to call out people for where they are in their positions, the purpose of their positions. Now, when it comes election time, um, so as a league, generally we we fundamentally oppose report cards of candidates, like trying to score candidates, right? Because we wouldn't participate in that because that would be partisan. But we can't, as we always say, we, um, we can't help whether the governor is a Democrat or a Republican, we're just looking at the issues. So it's actually very nonpartisan of us to, to be able to take on any legislator based on their issues. And, you know, there is, it just, as it turns out, a lot of people, it has nothing to do with liking the governor and it doesn't have to do with us saying, gosh, I mean, we did have a couple of members say, sort of say, why are you picking on the governor? <laughs> like, well, we're not picking on the governor. We're always advocating for our issues. Um, the issues too in the climate change report card are issues the governor has control over. Um, for the most part, I think he's had, and he and his staff have had some pushback and some of it could be rightfully so over how much authority he has in each area. But the issues in the report 
card were also selected based on things that he has responsibility and accountability for within the departments. So there are those things that go before the legislature. We didn't, we picked things that were um, within his control. Now, you also saw when we talk about electric cars, you saw how the situation panned out, right? It became in the end, this sort of debate that if you do this in your commission, you know, uh, Governor, we're not going to give you a budget. I mean, so we see how all these issues, unfortunately, get used as political footballs during the, the season, the legislative process. Um, but that is the process. The process is for us, uh, the only way we advocate is to be direct with legislators about what actions we want of them. So I, I feel, um, I think a lot of times people also feel that the League of Women Voters is um, are, are, is very democratic. They, we get, you know, you guys are all left of center. We, we hear that a lot, right? And, um, but we, in, a, in fact, we, we do offer critique um, of both parties and we offer support of both parties based, not based on their parties, but based on their positions. So when people, and I, so I think it's a great question and you might have other people in your leagues and it's great to take that message back. The simple message being, you know, we um, are not partisan, meaning we will address issues with our legislators, regardless of their political party. That's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but does that help? <laughs> I know, thanks. Yeah, I think too that we really, um, I, we had a similar issue when we, um, in January, last January, we did come out with our kind of 10 page truth and consequences letter based on um, the 14 people who signed on to the Texas, uh, the letter to the Texas Attorney General asking to be part of their lawsuit that would have um, tried to alter some of the results of the election. And, um, and the letter itself had a lot of factual errors in it in terms of their accusation that the Secretary of State was committing illegal acts. So we did call out those legislators who called, um, who were on that letter. We got some pushback on that. Do people say, well, you shouldn't be calling out legislator, you know, calling out legislators. And it's like, well, you know, again, uh, that's what, what we do is we're calling people out when they lie. Um, we will say you are lying. <laughs> that is an appropriate part. Um, but we didn't just say it, we backed it up with facts. And I think that was the part that we really we, we wrestled with and are proud of and why we joined on to this as well is that if you're going to make serious allegations, like if you're going to say there's voter fraud, you better have facts to back it up. So we did our 10 page, you know, um, truth and consequences to really show all the facts behind the reality that the Secretary of State acted in accordance with the law and that the elections were fair and accurate. And we laid that out in great detail as a model um, and I think in this case too, um, where now we're actually calling to task a, a, a democratic official, we're saying, here's the data. We're using the data um, as our way of expressing our advocacy. And I think that is something the league can continue to be really proud of is how much we, um, how much diligence we take and that our way of advocacy is really based on trying to show the benefit um, of the issues and positions we take versus simply a uh, shame and blame game, right? So good stuff. There's also hard stuff, um, right? There's a lot of very difficult as, as Kathleen and Sherry and Carol, others who are on the task force can tell you, there, it's, it's hard sometimes to figure out what our role is, what our appropriate words are when we're talking about it. So an issue right before us right now, for example, is line three. Um, you know, if Enbridge line three, um, we have signed on to every letter MEP has had that have pointed out the challenges and the difficult, I mean, a lot of the problems that have happened as a result of the process for line three, but we've never come out with an actual position that says whether we are support supportive or opposed <laughs> to line three. Um, specifically, we by default, we clearly show that we are opposed to line three. So we are working now with task force members to come up with a specific statement that says we are in fact opposed to line three 
for these reasons. And those reasons really intersect um, obviously with the climate science, but um, even stronger perhaps has to do with treaty rights um, and our commitment to DEI, as well as our commitment to good government and process and freedom to uh, protest. There are serious problems with transparency um, and with uh, suppression of the of protests that are legal, that should be legal. So we have really three big stakes in the ground when it comes to line three to speak out against line three. Um, again, it's not as the League of Women Voters, it's not like we would lead a rally on that, but we are strong allies to those who are leading those rallies. But I think um, the Climate Change Task Force gives us a way to remind ourselves, you know, we could be stronger on this and we can, and then to help us do it. I know um, I've got some members of the task force helping to write that statement. So that will probably come out uh, early this fall um, or as soon as we can pull that together. So there are a variety of issues that are challenging and there's just a lot to talk about, right? A lot of nuances to the work we do in this space. Um, I'm going to read a comment. Let's see in the chat from Ann Wildenborg to the US House is deciding right now what they will take on climate change. Um, now until September 1st is the critical time to go big on climate this year. Ask your US representative to include a carbon price in the budget reconciliation package. An easy way to do this is to, oh yeah, you give all, all that stuff you told us about, Ann. Uh, request us from the Citizens Climate Lobby. So in there she has the uh, CCL USA, it should be .org slash house um, to do that action. As the League of Women Voters, officially through the state, when it's like I said, if it's a US action, we usually go through US. But as individuals, it's also a reminder on all of this stuff. Any, everybody is a voter first and a citizen first. You don't need, even if you have a league hat on, you can certainly take your league hat off and make um, and go ahead to talk to your US House of Representatives um, as Michelle Witte. I can do that any day. But if I'm going to be Michelle Witte, Executive Director of the League of Women Voters Minnesota, then I, we coordinate with our lobby core at the US level. So good stuff. Great questions. Anything else? Anyone? Um, so what I want to do now really quickly, find myself here again, um, <clears throat> and just share my screen one last time. And um, remind you too that we are going to do a survey um, and you will we'll, have an opportunity to talk about this, but also um, you all are not on this on this um, in the space necessarily league leaders, so you don't have to worry about uh, the contact information note. But I did want to note that we would love for you, those of you if you want to be in the loop to email us and let us know so we can get you on that mailing list. What will be important? One of the things we are trying to work toward, <coughs> excuse me, in this next year is to identify more individuals who want to help us with advocacy. So if we need to appeal to a legislator in Dakota County, for example, who in Dakota County wants to be able to, to do that? So it's great to know that you're interested and that we could call on you as action occurs. And certainly um, try to re certainly reach out to Carol um, Stoddart to get involved. If you want to do a local league action project, she can help you out there. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope this helps you figure out our positions and what we're doing and how you can get involved. Thanks, Michelle. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye.